thanks for coming, you guys. <laughs> um, this is Ask a Lycanologist, part, I don't know, three? Are we on three yet? Three. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a little regular web meetup we've been doing uh, as part of the California Lycanological Society, California Lycan Society, to um, basically help people ID stuff and talk about lichens. Um, so can we all go around and introduce ourselves? Oh, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Kenichi. I'm, I don't know, a member of the society. Tom? Uh, my name is Tom Carlberg. I'm vice president of the California Lichen Society, and I am a lichen guy. A serious lichen guy. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, not as good as I could be, but definitely serious. <laughs> Sarah? Oh, hi. I'm Sarah. I am secretary of the California Lichen Society. And behind me, here, I'll switch. <laughs> hi, I'm Shelly. I am the president of the Lichen Society. I like your super fast switch, guys. That was really impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, Hannah. I'm Hannah. Yeah. And, um,. I'm the community outreach slash production editor for CALS, and I uh, kind of am crossing over into the dark side of bryophytes, but it's okay. Oh, no. <laughs> you yeah. the force. I've fallen into a moss, a moss patch, and it's hard to get out. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes there are little lichens in the moss patch. Yeah. Oftentimes they do grow together. So, Kenichi, do we actually have anybody who has joined us other than us four or five? Uh, in the Google Hangout, it's just us, but other people can watch. I don't think we have any spectators as of yet, but we'll be recording this, and um, re it'll be recorded on YouTube. So can you share the link, and I can post it? Yeah, the link is this. Um, <laughs> is that supposed to look like it says sexy? <laughs> Be sexy. <laughs> oh my god, that is no, that's just an <laughs> Lichens are sexy. <laughs> yeah. You to be no it's actually sexy, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning red. Sorry, I keep forgetting that it turns off my mic when I type. So what we usually do on these is we uh, go through contributions to the iNaturalist Ask a Lycanologist project and try to ID or at least leave a comment saying why we can't ID or, or what people might do to uh, learn more about a particular lichen. But before we get started doing that, does anyone have anything they wanted to discuss or announce lichenologically? <laughs> Was this the time where we discuss all our board meeting topics? Uh, if you really want to. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. Do you like it? <laughs> right. Um, did anyone have anything else they wanted to talk, talk about before we start looking at some pictures? Uh, no, I'm ready to go. I'll take your silence as a no. Okay, so the first one I wanted to look at, oh, and if anyone sees something in the project that they, that they want to talk about, please shout out and post the URL and um, I'll, I'll post the image. What I wanted to talk about is this cool way of things uh, photographed by INAT user named Robberfly. And let me share my screen so that you guys can, can see that. Can you guys see that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I posted the URL in the chat window, so if you guys can't see that image very well, um, you can click on that. And ask me to, to zoom in. I can. So, folks. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's folks. Yeah, first of all, a totally great array of lichens. Um, Why was ready? this not submitted for our calendar project? 
20, 2015 calendar project submission right there. <laughs> uh, I should mention also that, that this photo was taken in, in the Sierras uh, near Colville, which, let's see here. It looks like it's near Levitt Peak, if you guys know where that is. I know roughly where Colville is. I don't know Levitt Peak. It's not really my part of the world. Yeah, it's not really mine either. I believe it's south of Yosemite. I'm not quite seeing where it's at. Oh, it's just north of Yosemite, actually. Um, let's see. Elevation was... Looks like elevation's around like 9,700 feet. Wow. Yeah, so pretty high up there. Um, you guys have any ideas of what any of these things might be? Okay. I know nothing about lichens and, uh, well, not nothing, but very little. But my question is, is the yellow the Acherospora? Could it be? It could be. It, it could, could also, also be, be Rhizocarpon, right? Oh. No. I don't think there's enough black stuff in there to be rhizocarpon, but it might also be pleopsidium. Oh, that might be what it is. This Maybe. Is it's, you'd, ha you'd need micro work to go from here, unfortunately. Um, the gray stuff in the middle with the black disks, that's uh -huh. going to be a... Uh, actually, a, well, I'm guessing it's a xantholparmelia, which is probably the most photographed lichen on iNaturalist. <laughs> hey, Tom, what about, do you think it could be a little umbilicate thing? No, the other thing I was thinking it might be was a rhizocarpon, but, um, not rhizocarpon, uh, rhizoplaca, but I think it's the wrong color for that. Well, why, although there does look like maybe there is doing? an umbilicaria in between things there, possibly. I believe there is. The the kind of brownish color. So I see brown, red, yellow, gray. So over here on the right of this image now, that looks like it might be umbilicaria. Yeah, it's hard to see. Oh yeah, there's an umbilicaria, sure. Yeah. In the in yeah. the center of the right hand edge there. It's like yeah. where's Waldo? How many <laughs> lichens are in this photo? No, prob <laughs> probably a dozen. <laughs> Yeah, so that one that's now like all the way on the left hand side and it is kind of that grayish green with all those apothecia. I don't what what is that other umbilicate lichen that's that kind of greenish gray color? You know which one I'm talking about? You mean dermatocarpon? Yeah, could it be a dermatocarpon? Because as far as the xantoparmelia, I don't really see any lobes going on for it. Well, dermatocarpons have parathesia, not apothesia, so probably not that. Um, Can you define parathesia? I don't actually know what those are. Uh, an apothecium is a disc-shaped spore-producing structure, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's okay. usually external to the lichen thallus. A parathesium is a flask-shaped, in section this is flask-shaped spore-producing structure, and it's usually internal to the thallus of the lichen. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So does it, does it look like a little hole in the thallus then? Wow, your voice just went bonky bonky. Could you repeat that, please? Does it, does it look like a little hole in the thallus? It looks like a black dot on the upper surface of the thallus, yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't think dermatocarpon. I think what's, what's happening is that the lobes are so convoluted. I mean, this, this lichen could be, you know... 40 years old at this point, uh, and the high altitude stuff often gets warped and twisted because it, it just grows slowly and gets exposed with full sun, um, tremendous ultraviolet load. I just came down from some high altitude stuff in the Trinity Alps and saw a lot of very crisp and fragile convoluted lichens of all kinds. Hmm. Um, I, I could be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong, but uh, you know, with that dark disc and that and that thick thalline rim, and the fact that it's on rock, I would go with Xantoparmelia. Interesting. 
Headphone and I'm, actu I'm actually on the iNaturalist um, site right now, and I can't uh, can't zoom in close enough to see the logs that, that Shelley would like to see. So possibly Xanthoparmelia for the gray stuff? Yeah. And uh, the yellow you guys are saying is uh, what, an unknown crust or an unidentifiable crust? Well, I'm pretty sure it's either what um, Sarah said or what I said. I, I don't know if there are that many crusts that are so yellow. Uh, one was an Acarospora, uh, A-C-A-R-O-S-P-O-R-A. -O -O uh, or Rhizocarpon, was that the other one? Uh, Pleopsidium. Oh. P L E O F uh, P L E O P Sidium. Gotcha. Wow, you've got to zoom in way more than I did. <laughs> uh, and there's umbilicaria on the right. Hey. You guys, that one that uh, you were calling Xanthoparmelia, was that it? Uh huh. Um, could it be Rhizoplaca? Melanophthalma. Melanophthalma? Yeah, I mentioned that. Um, the oh, okay. color looks a little bit off to me, oh. but it could be. It, it looks a lot like it in, um, in Brodo. Can we, like, take our book and, like, turn it around and show it to the screen? <laughs> Yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> Let's try it. <laughs> okay. Like, I don't know if you guys can see this. Uh, I can see I it in your little picture. If you click but... on the little picture, you can see the little picture bigger. Okay. Is that even in focus? Yeah, no, it's, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> okay. Awesome. That's what we're sure. looking at. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put it away now. That does look pretty good. Is it at, like, high altitude? Let me, let's check it out. Yeah, I don't know, you know. the range for Rhizoplaca. The range would include, did you say it's, like, eastern Sierra? No, um, it's, like, right up in the middle. In the middle? Okay. Let's see. Tom or anyone, do you guys have any opinions on the orange stuff? Yeah, the red. Uh, yeah, Calaplaca. <laughs> it got me. Crust or set kind of like don't lend themselves to this kind of analysis, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah. But this is so much fun. <laughs> Dude, that picture we held up has a has a another red crust in it as well. Oh, really? So well, that's... It doesn't say what it is, though. <laughs> that clearly cinches it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I have my copy of Brodo around. Hold on a sec, guys. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, so, Tom, in the comments, they say that the color of the apothecia is pretty variable, and then it can be confusing as, as far as some of the different species. The color of the apothecium is variable, and what else? And depending on the color, you may confuse it for a different species. Oh, different species of rhizoplaca. Yeah. Rhizoplaca. But yeah, the range map in Brodo, it looks like it would cover kind of the Sierras and east of there. Well, but Xantha Parmelia would also do that. Mm hmm Would Rhizoplaca be considered folios? Like, would that be in the folios key? Rhizoplaca? Umbilicate. I, I think it's an umbilicate lichen. Oh, weird. Huh. 
Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, so kind of could be either at this point, huh? Yes. All right. Then that's what I'm going to leave in our official comment here. Robert Fly is a pretty um, frequent contributor to your to the lichens on iNaturalist. I've yeah, noticed. he's definitely one of our top users. <laughs> he posts a, a lot of stuff. Oh, not just lichens? Oh, yeah. Um, he's actually a butterfly expert um, in San Francisco. Oh. So he's, he's often traveling around the state doing surveys. Um, but since he got addicted to iNat, he's been observing everything, much to the chagrin, <laughs> of, his, much to the chagrin of his fellow lepidopterists. <laughs> so... But oh, well, like that's pretty good. He looks like an well, no, I shouldn't say that. He looks like an old, an older gentleman. It's pretty good that he gets up to nearly ten thousand feet. Oh, he's not that old. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, Mr. Robert Fly. <laughs> uh, cool. I'm gonna end that screen share. Um, so I left him a comment. The next one that I want to look at is. This guy. Uh, let me download that. So this one is from the north coast near you, Tom. This one, oh, good. Uh, yeah, this is up by Humboldt. Uh, let me download the image. Arcata, California. Oh, that's a yeah, that's like, from area. That's like in your backyard, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's probably out in the dune forest, actually. Yep, it sees on Manila. Look at that. Didn't we see this one when we were on that walk you hosted? We probably did. Um, it was, he got it, looks like he's up at Lanfear Christensen. Uh, so he was maybe a mile north of where you and I and Robert were, Hannah. Okay. So this is INET user RM. Oh, this is, yeah, that's or Rachel Pat. Pat. That's Rachel Oh, someone Patton. you know? Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Are we still recording? Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's see how good the resolution is on this. Um, there's Apothecia, so this is, she should know this one. It's Pseudocyphilaria anthraspis. <laughs> she did. I just, I invited it into the group because I wanted to get her uh, involved in it, and I, um, she well, looked like pretty, I need it. Yeah, she just had a typo, but I just sort of wanted to confirm. So this is definitely, um, and I've had trouble IDing this myself in the past. This is definitely anthraspis. Because of the apothecia. Okay. And so, so, course, sorry, go ahead, can you? Yeah, and not, why is it pseudocyphilaria and not uh, lobari or something else that looks... Well, that's the thing. You know, you officially you should look at the lower surface and see the pseudocyphilae, um, but lobaria... Uh, the only Liberia on the west coast that has apothecia doesn't come any further south than, I think, southern Washington. Hmm. And even that one's a range extension of about 600 miles from Alaska. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, the heavy texturing and stuff like that could be Liberia, but it would be Liberia um, pulmonaria, which does not produce apothecia unless it's being parasitized. Okay. Yeah, that's I'm sitting about <laughs> you know three miles from that location. Cool. Um, and this stuff looks really black when it's uh, wet, right? Uh, that one will go darker. Yeah, I wouldn't say really black. Not black, okay. Um, as opposed to Loberia pulmonaria, which goes, you know, wonderful, beautiful green when it, uh, yeah, you know that. Very vibrant green. Yep. Cool. Um, right on. I just wanted to get that one in there because she just, she just added it, uh, and I wanted to get some different users in here. There you go. Oh, so Sarah was just reading in, in Brodo about this, and... This is an interesting comment on this one is that, um, what did you say? It's the fertile, it's the fertile the, counterpart. It's the, the fertile, the fertile counter, counterpart of um, Pseudocyphilaria anomala. 
So, like Pseudocyphularia anomala has ceridia on those ridges, and then this anthrapsis has the apothecia. And they have the same chemistry. Oh, and they have the same chemistry. Hmm. Could oh, they yeah. possibly be the same species? <laughs> uh, well, mm, yeah, that's a good question, I guess. Right. But yeah, in the, in the comment, how they say it's the fertile counterpart. So evidently, that was enough for someone to split it to make <laughs> <a new> species. <laughs> hmm. That's interesting. Does that happen a lot with lichens? Like, there's things that look very similar, but one's fertile, one's not, and they split them? I don't know. Tom, do you know any others that are like that? There are. There's pairs that they call sister species sometimes, um, and the one that leaps to mind is Parmeliopsis ambigua versus Parmeliopsis hyperopta. It's, it's not a fertile ceridia difference. Um, it's a color difference. One is kind of mineral gray. The other one is a yellow green, and there's a chemical difference in the cortex as well, and that that sister grouping was debated for quite a few years. Some people thought it was the same species with a slight chemical variation. Others thought they were two separate species. Um, now that we can do DNA stuff, somebody did that, and they said, wow, these are different. Hmm. So those two species stood up to that test. Uh, I don't think anybody, to my knowledge, has done it for the, the Pseudocyphalaria pair that, that Shelley was just talking about. Uh, and there are fertile ceridia counterparts. Uh, is it well, Ramelana leptocarpha and Ramelana subleptocarpha are considered to be. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> subleptocarpha. <laughs> yeah, and they're considered to be a fertile ceridia pair or anomalous or what have you. Huh. Uh, okay. Can't think of any others offhand. Interesting. I did. All these kind of like pairwise things. Um, Does that happen okay. in other taxonomic groups? Um, Where there are know. closely closely allied species that are distinct but uh, closely related. I mean, yes, but there's sort of not thing. I, I, I guess with it, in a lot of other taxa, there's usually some distinct morphological difference. Whereas with in lichens, like you know. If it stains one color or another, apparently that's enough to, to speciate or to just decide that something is a different species. I mean, yeah, like, you know, in frogs, that ridiculous Sudacris regilla split between Sudacris regilla and what's now Sudacris sierra, there's no, there, the difference is strictly genetic. There's no distinct morphological difference between the two species. And the only way that you would tell them apart is by geography. But they overlap uh -huh. with, like at at the integrating area. Like who knows what you're seeing because they look identical. Yeah, that's that's a slightly different situation, and we have that situation in lichens too. The uh, what's it called? The water fan lichen, the Peltigera um, hydrothyria. There used to be populations in the Appalachians, the Rockies, and the Sierra Nevada. And this guy in New York did some work on. Um, East versus West, and he said, "Well, the Appalachian ones differ genetically, even though they even though they look the same. Huh. Uh, so, you know, that's not a fertile ceridia pairing. That's two identical morphologies that are genetically distinct. Um, in his case, and I think you mentioned this, Kenichi, that there's a geographic difference as well as a uh, genetic difference, and that seems to be enough for people." Hmm. Interesting. It's yeah, so, so now in the West we have Peltigera gawardii in the Sierras and the uh, uh, Rockies, and in the Appalachians it retains the old name of Peltigera hydrothyria. Huh. Cool. Which was once Hydrotheria venosa. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's very confusing name change on that one. Yeah, and it's also kind of frustrating how much faster names are changing given, you know, new genetic evidence, you know, across all taxa. Well, you know, lichens are unexplored territory. I mean, if, if you want to discover new species, look at lichens or maybe mosses, but lichens are less <laughs> known. Well, no, they're known, they're known even less than mosses are. Huh. That's so interesting. 
sort of like, you know, I would think mosses and lichens would be equally ignored. <laughs> well, in California, we have Jim Shivak and Dan Norris. Right. For, for mosses, that is. Uh, we don't have anybody like that for uh, <laughs> for uh, lichens, really. For lichens, as of yet. Yes. Uh, so the next one that I want to look at is also from the Sierras. This one is taken by INET user Farthen. Oh, the link is... Um, oh, yes. She works at one of the reserves. Yeah, so she works at uh, Sage Hen Field Station, which is one of the UC reserves. Uh, this is up near Truckee, just north of Lake Tahoe. And I believe that's where she took this. Let's confirm that. Yeah, this is up by, up by Sage Hen. Um, and as usual, I just picked it because it looks pretty But maybe you guys know what it is. It looks beautiful. Yeah, I don't. So, is it a crust? It does. It yeah, it looks too oppressed. It's not. It would not be folios, right? So it is crust. Well, there are low sure crusts, and I think that's what this is. But what it is, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's cool that that dark margin is really prominent. It's neat. Yeah, yeah. That I can't tell whether that's a hypothalamus or whether the lobe tips are discolored that way. But Can the hypothalamus. Uh, oh, sorry. The hypothalamus is when when in some lichens the fungus kind of grows outward before the before its elbow partner can okay. catch up with it. And it usually forms a black fringe or a blue fringe or sometimes a white fringe around the edge of the lichen proper. So it's kind of like the fungal partner, you know, breaking new ground. Interesting. But but those apothecia are really unexpected. The color and the thin margin on them. I know it's a crust, so this is kind of hard, but um, what would you guys want to see to, to get a bit further on, on an ID here? Uh, full suit of chemical tests and, uh, and a section of the apothecium. <laughs> oh, okay, a section, right. That might actually be doable for a lot of people if you have a decent macro setup. Well, yeah, but a lot of people don't have the razor blade skills to make the section. It's true. But sometimes they're pretty big, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one to get. Yeah. Um, yeah, but as far as the photograph, it looks really good in that, you know, we can see the margin, and so for this crest, I'm sure that lobate margin, and I, I bet that dark rim is going to be diagnostic, and then, you know, we get all those apothecia, and you can kind of see the you know, the center of this lichen, it looks like it does start kind of crumbling away with age. But, yeah, in terms of what they could get in the photograph, I think they did a really good job. It's just that, yeah, those crusts, you kind of need the, well, at least for, for me, since I don't know a lot of site ID on crusts, to key it, you, you have to do that section of the, the apothecia and look at those spore characters. Yeah, um... I don't know if Farthen has a compound microscope, but even doing a, a squash mount of some of the tissue from the epithecium, you know, probably it's going to turn out that they are uh, colorless, single-celled ellipsoid spores, which gets you absolutely nowhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they could be, you know, they could be large muriform spores that are, uh, have really thick walls or something like that. I, I don't think that's the case here, and that's kind of asking a lot of your iNaturalist uh, users. Right. Well, Farther might actually be able to get something. Um, they do have lab setups up there at Sage Hen, so if she's super enthused about getting an idea here, she might uh, give it a try. Hey, I wonder if she'd be interested in hosting a uh, California Lichen Society field trip. Uh, she might very well. If you guys are interested in that, we could definitely... See if she's if she's game. Let's let's put it out there and see what happens. All right, 
Farthen, if you're watching, <laughs> you might want to do a field trip. Uh, all right, save that. I mean, I know she does a lot of other stuff other than lichens, too. I've seen her images on INAT, uh, but she does a fair number of lichens. Yep. When was this one posted? Is it recent? I think that was recent, uh, July, July 24th 24. of this year. Yeah, pretty new. Right on. All right, I'm going to do... Sorry, go ahead, Tom. I was, just, I was just reading her comments. The black margins look like map lichen to me, but the orange center is odd. Yeah, let's see if we can do... Because Truckee is not that far from the Bay Area, is it? Like three hours? Oh, no, no, that's a pretty pretty easy trip. Yeah. Um, huh. Okay, I wanted to do one more from the Bay Area at least... Or not, uh, one more from the, the Sierras at least, if not more. We have a lot of Sierra contributions, obviously, because it's summer and people are getting up there and it's not covered in snow. Um, so this one... Also, ID it as map lichen or rhizocarpon. I don't know this genus at all, so uh, you guys can say yay or nay. Uh, it's not a very sharp image, so we might have some difficulty with it. Can you guys see that one? Yeah. South Lake Tahoe. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So this is by Justin Tu. Um, southwest of Lake Tahoe. Looks like it's almost right on Highway 50. Does. And uh, this was taken in late June. Looks like a iPhone image. Yes. Could be a mobile phone image. So I don't know Rise of Carpen at all. I'm looking at it now in Brodo, and there's at least one that looks kind of like this. At least it's sort of green and black. Although the one in Brodo seems to have apothecia, and I don't see any on this one. And it lives in Maine, which is not a good sign. I don't know what this is. Uh, usually, Rhizocarpon seems to have more yellow, and this has more black. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I give up. What is it? <laughs> None of us know, unfortunately. <laughs> Sarah, any thoughts? Yeah, we were us? just we were we were just looking through the book um, through Brodo's book, and it looked like there were three yellow rhizocarpons in there, and we we're just kind of checking range to see which one was the most likely. Oh, Geographicum, definitely. Yeah, so like rhizocarpon Geographicum is definitely in the area. Um, this one is. There's a section in California of Rhizocarpon macrosporum. There's a section in California? Is that what you said? What does yeah, that mean? South of the Bay Area. It looks like it runs from the coast all the way to the border with Nevada. This is the, the range map. The range in, map. In Brodo. Which is rough, I'm sure. So one thing that Brodo mentions is the the epihymenium being intense blue versus um, olive brown in other species. What's the epihymenium or hymenium? When you when you make a section of an apothecium, uh, the epihymenium is the topmost. It's probably seven microns thick or twenty microns thick. It's pretty small, but it's the topmost layer of the fertile tissue of the apothecium. Could you, you see it with a hand lens? No. Oh. 
Although the epi epihymenium is responsible for the color of the disc of the lichen, it often has a different coloration when you're looking at it in thin section. Hmm. So like some, some epihymeniums are green, and but the, the epithesium disc looks black. It, it's because when you're looking at them in thin section, it's a couple microns thick, so the light passes through. You can see the green color. When you're looking at the epithesium, it's it's you know millimeters thick, and you don't get to see that color. Hmm. I can um, can I post a picture? Yeah. Okay, give me a couple of minutes to find it. I can show you a green epihymenium. You can either screen share or send me the URL, and I and I can screen share it. URL. It's on my C drive, so there is no URL. Oh, then yeah, you'll have to you'll have to use the screen sharing function. Okay. Um, go ahead and continue. Sarah and Shelley, did you guys have any other opinions? I don't know what how many options there are. Yeah, from Brodo, I mean, it really looks like there maybe are four options or so, but um, just from looking at the range maps, there. It seems like Rhizocarpin geographicum is the most widespread. So while it could be something else, that's maybe the most likely. OK. Okay, how do I screen share then when when you have a minute, Kenichi? Screen share. So screen share should let you, it, 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 at least on my computer, it will let me choose a window that I want to share, or you can share an entire window. Oh, that looks good. Oh, you can see that then. Yeah. Yeah, so, so can you see my mouse, the cursor? Yeah. Okay, so the epihymenium is the, and it's not terribly green, but the greenish layer at the top of this, well, what we're looking at is a thin section of an epithesium. Okay. Uh, and this topmost layer is what you would see with your naked eye. You would be looking at it from this direction, from the outside. Uh, and then beneath that, and this is, this is not a good section to look at to look at structures, but it's good for the color. Uh, this, this whitish layer in the middle here, um, the, those are the, 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 as, the assi and the paraphyses. I know, very technical book vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> and this very greenish section down here is the, uh, God, my brain is just going to sleep. Sarah, it's the subhymenium. It's the oh, it's the hypothesium. Huh. There we go. <laughs> now you know so much. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. There there there's there's very specific words to use for this, and you just have to learn them. Basically, the sub the hypothesium, this greenish area, is the this is where the spore producing tissues get generated, and these are the spore producing tissues that got generated. And then this topmost layer is the epihymenium. How do I stop? How do I stop screen sharing? Uh, click the screen share button on the left. A second time. Okay. And you should be back to normal. Uh, awesome. That was great. That was so yeah. cool to see, a, see the I actual know. slide. Everybody probably just turned off <laughs> when they saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone's watching it all. Um, Hannah, are you still with us? I see you, you just recommended uh, Tefromula armeniaca. I don't know that one either. Oh. Tefromula. I assume that's another crust? Yes, it is. Uh, it's distinctive because when you section the epithesium, what is it? Everything is blue-gray or something like that? It's one of the few lichens that's. There's something unique about the coloring of the epithelial section. Hmm. 
I'm looking in Brodo now, and they definitely have some uh, some yellowish ones. Teframila atra is uh, is one. It looks like, at least according to Brodo, Teframila armeniaca is not in the Sierras, but Teframila atra uh, is. Uh, so does he that. does he does he say what distinguishes Teframila atra? You would think he would. Let's see. Well, here. sometimes he gives you the keys to the kingdom in the comments, and other times it's not that simple. Right. Um. Yeah, he says it's very easy to identify when viewed under a microscope. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in the field it looks like a lot of other things. So, a possibility. Um, Thanks, Hannah. That was, I never would have thought of that. Cool. Uh, let's see if we can find one that's not in the Sierras. I'm, I'm glad you had a chance to um, kind of vet some of these uh, observations, Kenichi, because I haven't been on iNaturalist for quite a few weeks, I think. You've added a ton of IDs over the past couple months, so <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's the cast couple months. And we seem to have lost Shelley and Sarah's camera. Yeah, Are but I think they were... Oh, we're, you... we're still here. We were, <laughs> we were in the middle of dinner, and we were... Um, Moving around and shoving food in our mouths, so we turned the camera off. We turned that off. It was kind of it was kind of relaxing watching you guys eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it was very, it's very friendly, you know. Familial. But it's up to you. It's up to you. So right, when we break out. When we break out dessert, we'll turn the camera off again, so you won't get jealous. <laughs> uh, what are you having for dessert? I made some little uh, berry galettes. Are those little pastry things, little pastry cups with foofy stuff in them? It's basically like a pie, but not in a pie dish. You just use the dough, and you, yeah, like fold the dough up around the fruit. Oh. What lichen do they most resemble? <laughs> well, <that's a> <laughs> Something squamulous and yeah. nasty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, speaking of nasty looking lichens, I'm going to be totally self serving and post one of my pictures. Uh, and I'll screen share this as well. Oops. Ooh, look at that. Sorry. I love it when people take pictures of black lichen. You guys see that? Yeah. And we know what it is, too. You know what, Tom? The whole reason that I, I take pictures of black lichens is, is because of you. Because you were all like, at, in Nolan Park, you are like, ooh, check that one out. And I'm like, ooh, those are cool. Okay, I'll take pictures of all black lichens from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the trouble is finding them and recognizing them as a lichen. It's, it's not easy. Yeah, because they look like shadows most of the time. I'm about to lose my audio here because of the kitty. Okay, we're safe. Okay, so this one, uh, like I said, was taken by me. This was down in Big Sur uh, in Monterey County. Um, it was a kind of mossy embankment that in a canyon that probably gets a, a fair bit of moisture at parts of the year, but when I was there in June, it was quite dry. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't provide much scale. I'd say this entire little patch was pretty small, three to four centimeters, I think is what you're seeing in this picture. Probably less than that, actually. Maybe like two to three centimeters uh, shown here. I think the moss is uh, like dendrousia or something that provides any kind of scale. I have to ask Hannah that one. <laughs> Shelly, you know what this is. Come on. Yeah, I don't know which species it is. 
Don't. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go to. I'm gonna go get a beer. You have to figure it out before I get back. <laughs> so I I thought it was something like Leptogium or Kalima, like in that that neck of the woods. Yeah, I think you're right on there. It's it's one of those two genera, and I guess I would I would guess more for a Leptogium. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess there's the way I kind of tell you. Well, the way I know to tell them apart definitively is you have to do a cross section and look at whether it has a cortex or not. Um, and I think t Tom, this is like Tom's favorite group, and so I think he can really, I think he more has a feel for it. So it'd be good to get his perspective on what what he looks at, you know, without doing a section to tell them apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, these guys, they look so different when they're dry versus when they're wet, and it would be neat to see this one kind of wetted and springy, because it's kind of hard to tell what's going on <laughs> in there with the lobes, because they're all kind of curled up and contorted. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a screen share again, if I can do this right. Okay. There's the button. And there's the picture. Okay, can you guys see this now? It looks like I it's, can it's see. the same picture that the I want to show you my cursor. Oh, I so see. So see see this little two horned thing right here? Yes. And the word horn is very significant here. Uh well do you used to be. They've changed the name back to some older name, so it's no longer the Cornute Leptogium. So here's another little horn, and here's two more horns. Hmm. And there's a tiny little horn. And it used to be called Leptogium Cornutum. And Cornute means horn. It's now called Leptogium Palmatum. Oh, it's that. Yeah, and it has these little the the lobe tips are are curled up into these little conical shapes. This one happens to be heavily fertile, which I hardly ever see where I live. But again, I just came back from some Trinity Alps stuff, and uh, it's much hotter and drier, and there's a lot more fertile. Uh, Leptogium palmatum when the weather gets hotter. The other thing that happens, and I learned this, Shelley, from your uh, uh, that Pinnacles inventory that you had us do. Uh, when things get hotter and drier, Leptogium palmatum develops a lot more hair on the lower surface. And when I got your Pinnacles specimens from Pinnacles National is it a national park now or a national monument? They just changed their status. It's now a yeah, park. It's now thank, a park. Thank you. So when I got Shelley's Leptogium palmatum from Pinnacles National Park, I freaked out because I had no idea what this hairy Leptogium was. <laughs> and, and I had to search really hard to find in the descriptions in the books that I have, I had to look really hard to find a description of Leptogium palmatum that talked about the hair on the lower surface. And I had never seen it where I live on the northwest coast. Hmm. I have to admit I'm a little disappointed because I've already, I've seen Leptogium palmatum before. Uh, I, thought this was, I thought this was a new one. I was like, ah, oh, I got another one. But. <laughs> Well, it's a nice one, though, and and you know hardly anybody on INAT uh, takes pictures of leptogiums. Yeah, they're so small, and they're so dark, and they're usually yeah. on the ground. Let's see here. So you were in Monterey, huh? Yeah, I was on a California Native Plant Society trip, which was a lot of fun. But just like Robert Fly, I get distracted by other things very frequently. <laughs> so, uh, Thank goodness. Took some time to take some pictures of lichens. Let's see if we can find at least one more to do today. I wanted to do another one that was in Southern California. 
And again, if you guys are seeing anything in the group that pops out to you, holler. You get around quite a bit, Kenichi. This summer I've been traveling quite a bit, yeah. I see you're um, in Big Sur. All right, we'll do this one, even though it's not the best picture. You guys might be able to work with it. Saving that. So this one is by iNet user Snake in My Pocket. Uh, this was down in Encinas in, near San Diego. Yeah, just screen share this. So I don't know if this is another cow placa or if it's even possible to tell. It clearly grow, grow, looks like it's growing on, on stone and it's a crust. Looks like it's on a concrete building wall or something. Yeah, that could also be true. Uh, location doesn't look immediately coastal, but it's pretty close to the ocean. Yeah, I think I see at least one apothecia, and yeah, I would I would venture Calaplaca, but <laughs> I wouldn't know what species. Yeah, Just because it's, it's orange. Not... Yeah, because it's an orange crust, and then I see an apothecia on the top edge of the photo. And it's oh, another really? orange apothecia. It's also on concrete, and calip some species of caliplaca really like that um, basic substrate. The pH is very low, no, high on mm -hmm. concrete. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I couldn't tell you much more. It's not that the photo's bad. Um, there's just not a lot to go by. Okay. So possibly cal caloplaca, which I, of course, is spelling caloplaca. <laughs> Orange is crust. Uh, it's on a high pH substrate like concrete, and it's got one orange apothecium toward the top there. Oh yeah, now I'm, I'm finally seeing that. But hard to confirm. Yeah. Alrighty. Thanks for taking care of all the keyboard work, Kenichi. Uh, got all of us in the same room this time. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, all right, can we do one more before we before we close up? Sure. So this one is a bit. This is not my observation. It's but it is self-serving. This is by INET user uh, Finatic. This is also from Southern California, um, near San Diego. And this one is actually already identified as Lotharia vulpina. Oh, actually, you identified it as Lotharia vulpina, Tom, now that I'm looking at it. And my, my question for this one is, like, how do you know that it's, it's vulpina and not, is it columbianum? Because I feel like if you're, if you're not seeing apothecia, it could be either, right? Um, there is a distinction in the key. I just happen to have my McCune guide here because I've been working on Trinity Alps stuff. Uh, so, Lotharia, no, Lotharia, Lotharia. If there are Ceridia, it's Vulpina. If okay. the Ceridia are lacking, and you can have either Isidia or Apothecia or both, but if Ceridia are not there, it's either Columbiana or Gracilis. This is in the Pacific Northwest. Where are we? San Diego. 
Yeah. Uh, that probably applies in San Diego, too, but I'm not sure. Does Brodo say anything about other Lotharias in California? Lotharia. I don't have my Brodo out. It's on the bookshelf over there. I don't think there are are others in California according to Brodo, but let me see. Yeah, we just had Brodo open and it had two. It had um, Columbiana and um, and Vulpina and the key break is Ceridiate, Apothecia Rare or um, Apothecia Present and Ceridia are absent. So, so. so, so the absence of Ceridia is definitive whereas the Apothecia might be one way or the other. So Finatic did post this other picture um, that's closer oh, yeah. up. It kind of, they look, I don't know, are those Ceridia? They don't look that powdery to me. Well, sometimes Ceridia are more granular than powdery. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, would, I would go with the Apothecia being rare, making it Vulpina. Uh -huh. Okay, that's always sort of troubled me because I'm always like, <laughs> I have to get into species when I find one of these, but they don't always have the apothecia. But I'll look for a serenity next time, next time I see one. Yeah, and I, I think you know most people I know they just look for apothecia. If they're not there, they call it vulpina. I think that the the rarity. I've never seen vulpina. Well. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> if there's apothecia, I call it columbiana. Right. And probably some of my collections are vulpina. But I think that the rareness of the apothecia in vulpina is probably 95% of the time accurate just because of what people use. Cool. All right. I've been at it for an hour, so I think we can... We can call it. Did anyone else have anything that they wanted to talk about or feature or um, any? One, one question for anybody who has Brodo open. Are are both Columbiana and Vulpina called the wolf lichen? Yes, he refers to the entire genus as the wolf lichens. Okay. And I know that Gracilis was described as a species after the Brodo book came out, so that's why it's not in there. Oh, is that a strictly northwestern one? I'm I'm not sure. Well, actually, let me check. Area gracilis. Rain. Sarah, have you ever tried dyeing with this? Well, what? Oh, dyeing? Yeah. Somebody did somebody say dyeing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, just, I was just I was just reading in Brodo that they apparently you can use Lotharia to dye yellow. Have you ever tried dyeing with it? Yeah, yeah, it works really well. Oh, um, really? Yeah, actually, Shelley and I um, taught a workshop at the Sonoma County Mycological Association camp, Soma camp, this last winter, and we brought three species of lichens to die with, with the group, and uh, one of them was Lotharia, well, it was like various, Vulpina and Columbiana mixed, probably, so mm -hmm. both of them work, and um, the dye turns out about the same color as the lichen, which is somewhat rare because cool. a lot of times you get a, a magic new color. <laughs> but um, yeah, it turns out a beautiful yellow color. So uh, I, I probably do you, do you boil wouldn't. It? Huh? You just boil it? Sorry, yeah. I was going to. I mean, do, do you do you boil the lichen to to get the dyeing? Yeah, dye. you just. You just boil it um, until the color comes out of the lichen into the water, and then you, you dip. We dip yarn into it. And, um, was I going to say? Oh, you probably don't want to suck on your yarn afterward because it is poisonous. <laughs> oh, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's watching and is about to dye their yarn, and don't <laughs> 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 Try it, but just know that it is poisonous, and you know, obviously, don't do it in your cooking utensils. You always have to have a separate pot that you dye with, that you put things in that you would never eat. <laughs> yeah, otherwise you'd be spelling dye a little differently. So, so have you have you read much about the poisonousness of Lotharia species, Sarah? Um, only I guess kind of the 
stories that um, I think maybe a lot of us have read that it had been used in the past to poison sheep. I mean, sorry, to poison wolves, um, and even sometimes had been put into the body cavities of dead sheep, and then so that the wolves could come and eat come and eat the sheep, and then would die afterwards. So I don't know how true those stories are, but yeah, I don't know either. Um, I I had somewhere I read that it was specific to the genus Canis, which would be dogs and wolves. Um, I don't I don't know anybody who's tried it on humans. Oh, like <laughs> so, they be poisonous potentially to humans. Well, who's willing to try? Okay. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> so maybe it's mammals it's poisons. I don't know. But yeah, I, I, had, I had heard about it uh, being mixed with meat. I hadn't heard dead sheep, but mixed with meat and, and left out for wolves to kill well, them. Yeah, or mixed with, I think uh, Shelley heard with lard, like boiled and mixed with lard and then yeah. set out in pans for, nice. for uh, wolves to eat. So Nice. That, yeah. that sounds really hard to resist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big chunk of lard and lothari out in the middle of the woods. I mean, God, I'd be a goner. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should come up and visit the northwest coast sometime, Kenichi. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of that going out there. <laughs> There's lard um, and lothari it, everywhere. Just to follow up on the Letheria gracilis, the species that's not in Brodo, uh, the range is the Siskiyou Mountains in California and Oregon and the Sierra Nevada. Oh, okay. So Interesting. Be, beware all of you Central and Southern Californians. <laughs> you might be looking at a different Letharia. Exactly. Huh. Cool. Um, all right, so shall we call it? Well, Sarah and Shelley have already left. I think the uh, vignettes or whatever they're making yeah, are done now. It's dessert time for some of us. I heard the timer go off. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, right on. Well, thanks for thanks for showing up, everyone, and I'm glad it, it worked and we got everyone on what, board. Wait, what? What does it look like? Which species does it look like? What? Ooh, ooh, it's it's Diplochistes muscorum. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> It's got the recessed uh, apothecial disc and everything. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Good. That makes me slightly less jealous. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, right, guys. Kenichi, for putting this together. Yeah, no problem. Um, and until next time, then. Until next time. All right. Good night. Good night, everybody. Later.